Hi, I'm Dustin Abbott, and I am here today to give you my definitive review of a very unique new camera just being announced today, and that is Sigma's new FPL camera. Now, quick history, uh, last year Sigma introduced the first FP camera. They have of course, most of us know Sigma as a lens maker, which is their, their primary purpose. But they've actually been making cameras for a while around their own Sigma SA mount. Now, in this case, they uh, begin to move into these kind of more mirrorless space by utilizing actually the Leica L mount. And so we've seen a lot of development in the last couple of years of Sigma lenses that have both, uh, in many cases, like a Sony uh, E-mount, full-frame E-mount, and then also a Leica L-mount. And part of that is that allegiance here to where they're not only building for Leica, but also utilizing Leica's mount, and so that the FP series can access the whole Leica catalog. Now, the first FP camera was a more typical 24 megapixel full-frame, you know, and was kind of the world's smallest of its kind. Sigma has kept that up, but now they have gone to a much, much higher resolution. And the FPL is a 61 megapixel, extremely high resolution camera that continues to have an extremely small footprint. And so as you can see, without a lens attached, this is a very small body that is fairly similar in size to something like an A6400 or an A6600 from Sony. Very compact, more like akin to an APS-C body than a full frame. Today's episode is brought to you by Phantom Wallet, the minimalist modern wallet that sets you free from the bulky traditional wallet while also making it easy to access your cards and money when you need them, thanks to their unique fanning mechanism. Visit phantomwallet.com to check out their unique sizes, styles, and finishes that span from aluminum to wood to carbon fiber. You can even customize your wallet with new accessories like a money clip, cash holder, ID display, and even the Chipolo tracking integration if you're the kind of person who loses their wallet. Use code DUSTIN15 for 15% off when you're ready to check out. Now today we're going to do a definitive review and uh, break down everything in detail, including uh, various aspects of the design and the performance, the autofocus performance, the image quality, and if you prefer a quicker review, I recommend that you take a look at the standard review instead. So we're going to start by jumping in and taking a look at the a little bit closer at the design and some of the unique and quirky elements of this particular design. Let's jump in and let's take a look. So we obviously are working around a 61 megapixel full frame sensor and a Leica L mount, which gives you access obviously to a lot of uh, different lenses. Now the weight of the camera is nice and lightweight, only 427 grams, and so certainly that is a nice thing. This is the smallest way to get to such high resolution and one of the smallest, if not the smallest of the full frame bodies, you know, excluding the original FP itself. And so this camera is designed around a, a lot of a very different philosophy than anything I'm accustomed to. Typically, you know, more expensive full frame cameras are designed to have everything kind of working within it. In this case, you've really got more of a modular design. And so if you want to have even a hot shoe, for example, that is, it comes with it, but it is something that you actually have to install for use here. And so it'll actually, uh, you have to remove this port here on the side and there's a communication uh, threads there. And so this has to actually connect into that and make a physical connection. And then there is a wheel here that you use to tighten it down. And now you have got communication to a hot shoe over here. So, I mean, that's kind of the basic design all around. And for the first time, they have now introduced a actual EVF for it. The EVF is a little more complicated to put on. And I, I do think that there's some vulnerability here because it actually has to make contact not only with these points, but then also with going into both the HDMI and then also the USB-C. And so, again, I'm working with, uh, you know, pre-production samples here. And so it is a little bit, um, what I've got here, it doesn't always mount perfectly first go. And so, uh, you know, I'm assured that the uh, production models will tighten in there a little bit better and more smoothly. One of the big challenges is that this 
door. This cover comes off here, and there's actually a place in the viewfinder for you to put that there and to store it, and so that you don't lose it, which, you know, unfortunately, knowing human nature, there's a good chance you're gonna end up doing that anyway. In this other case, however, over the USB-C port, you have to kind of simultaneously pin that down and then line up these uh, two different ports are at the same time. So the best way to do it is to insert things in and so that those two are in and then use the wheel to finish the job tightening on down. And uh, hopefully if you have done things right, you will get a smooth finish here. Now, even with this utilized, one thing I did note almost immediately is that the power button becomes a little less accessible with that in place. You have to kind of reach over and around to get at it. But then you also have to actually manually switch between the EVF and the screen. Uh, you know, we're kind of spoiled and accustomed to that being automatically sensed. That's not the case here. Now, I will note that they have added on some redundancy here, so you still can access the USB-C port, and thus you could connect to a, you know, external drive. There is a, um, a monitoring port here for uh, headphones, and then also they have an additional uh, connection port there where you could mount on a lug, for example, like this, or, you know, some other kind of accessory into place there. And the viewfinder has, you know, it's a nice enough viewfinder. I do like the fact that you can tilt it up and down. It gives you some versatility there. Uh, the viewfinder does have a good resolution. I think 5.6 million dot resolution. Its refresh rate of 60 frames per second is only okay, um, not exceptional, but you know, this isn't necessarily a much of an action camera anyway. So, you know, for its intended purposes, it all works fine. Now the camera itself is only a little over 112 millimeters in width, 70 millimeters in height, and then a very minuscule 43 and a half millimeters in terms of the overall depth. Now, obviously, again, it's designed to be modular to where you can add on to this as the basic framework. One thing I really do like that they have done here is that they have helped to solve the heat problem by actually physically including heat sinks all around here that are a part of the design. Now, that probably has some impact upon, you know, weather sealing, but, you know, for those that are more focused on heat dissipation, that is obviously a strength and that's part of what allows you to get long format, you know, two hour recording times, uh, even in 4K, which obviously is fantastic. Where you kind of get left off is that you basically have almost no, uh, nothing to grip onto here. You have a very flat front and even the texture ends right there. And so there's not a lot to hang on to. The closest thing you have to grip is a little bit of a bulge here for the thumb to hang on to. And so it's not the easiest camera to actually physically hold. Now you can get a grip extension that you can add on that would add a little bit more grip into that if that is your preference. But obviously uh, the ergonomics for hand holding are not great, but it does allow it to be really, really compact by making all those things something you externally add on and so for example if you're working for a uh, off like of a gimbal or you're wanting to set up into a rig and you need the body to be as small as possible or even if you're a hiker and you want you know high resolution but a smallest camera as possible you may appreciate this approach um, but probably not everyone will because you know you're going to end up being out at times without a viewfinder, not to mention the fact that the viewfinder itself is expensive to add on. Now, I don't love the fact ever when the uh, memory card is located down in the battery door here. And so in this case, we have got a battery pack, the BP-51. It is a 1200 mAh um, battery pack, so on each one. You can expect to get, I think, a rating of uh, 200, 250 shots. And so it's not necessarily amazing. You're going to want to have multiple ones. A little bit different a design there where it's almost like more like I've seen this on like battery grips where it is a little bit different approach. But one thing that I do like is that I was able, for example, to, I like a lot of times I put on these peak design. I like to make everything Ar Arca Swiss compatible so I can just throw it onto a tripod. And so a lot of times I will put these, um, these little arc, these little peak design plates on there that make it Arca Swiss. Now in some cameras, I'm impeding the battery door even with something smaller than a QR plate like this. In this case, it doesn't impede that door at all. So I think that that design is a positive one. 
Physical controls are a little bit different than what we've seen here before uh, in a couple of ways. There's only two different control points, front top, or the top slash front wheel, and then the back wheel here. Power is here. Now the FPL utilizes the increasingly popular kind of dual configuration. So up top you can switch between a stills configuration that's going to give you a different cue menu than, for example, if I switch over into the cine mode and then go into that menu, you're going to see that it's configured a little bit differently. Now when it comes to the actual um, cue, cue menu, it has a really clean looking layout. I really like the layout and the look of the fonts and everything. However, it looks like it's ready for touch action and unfortunately it is not. And so you have to navigate it by either selecting what you want and then you rotate the dial to get at the different configurations. You can use either dial that you prefer, but you have to navigate, uh, you know, using the directional pad like this to navigate that menu. The same is true if you go into the main menus here and uh, you know you have to work through them in that fashion and again they're really clean uh, the fonts are very nice I like I like the design here other than the fact that the functionality should be a little bit better down along the bottom you have some additional um, buttons and you can tell kind of the purpose of this camera in part I'm going to go back to Cine for a moment in that you've got a color button right here that is designed to allow you to switch between your different um, color modes of which there are 14, we'll get to that in just a second, um, by just navigating here quickly. And you can go to your tone and so you can play with your tone curve and give you some control over that um, as well. And so, um, you know, some decent physical controls here, just a little bit different configuration than maybe what we are accustomed to. I do like that there is the dedicated record button that is easy to get at. What I don't like is that probably due to getting the heat sinks here, the the rear LCD is fixed. And so, you know, it's amazing how quickly you forget what it's like to have to, you know, hunker down to look at something instead of being able to tilt the screen or use an articulating screen. So certainly my preference is to have a, not a fixed screen, but a screen that can move around even on a gimbal. You know, if I was shooting down at lower angles or high angles, I couldn't see the screen at all. And so you're almost always going to need an external monitor for those types of situations. One thing that I do like as a feature here is that you have the option of uh, pinching at any point to zoom into different configurations. And so that's a handy thing because, uh, you know, rather than having to jump into a menu, you can actually do a pinching action. And so you can change the amount of zoom that is a part of this. And so this is a, a, a cropping of the zoom. However, if you're because of the very high resolution, in many cases, you can crop if you're shooting only uh, full HD, you can crop up to five times. And then here, even in 4K, you can crop up to 2.5 times. And that's a lossless crop just because of how much the, of the sensor is being utilized. And so obviously that can be very, very useful to give you some different framing options without a loss of resolution. I can't say that I have loved the ergonomics of this camera, but it's mostly because I'm accustomed to having a viewfinder out in real world use, being able to move my screen around and have a little bit different controls that I'm more accustomed to. I'm sure I would adjust to it just like you do to anything else, but it's definitely a different approach than the mainstream approach, a little bit of a quirky camera when it comes to the ergonomics. Maybe that will suit your purposes, maybe it won't. And so, as you can see, there's there's definitely a, Sigma has taken a road less traveled. And so there are elements there that I like. I like the look of the fonts and the unique, mem you know, kind of menu design. I do like the fact that heat sinks are built in. And so that does enable a few strengths like long format recording. You can uh, record up to two hours internally uh, with no shut off, no 2959, anything like that. It is also ready to go as a webcam right out of the box. And so um, you can hook up through USB-C and you know immediately use it as a very high definition webcam, which is obviously much more important to us these days than what it was a year ago. And so there's aspects of that that I think are certainly good in the physical design. I like the fact that it can run off external power, obviously to record to external monitors, which by the way, if you wanna unlock all aspects of the video mode, some of those um, like the Cinema DNG requires you to record if you're wanting to do it to you know, 30 frames 
frames per second essentially. You're going to have to do that by recording to an, an external uh, hard drive or source. And so you can't internalize some of that. But certainly a heat sink design is helping them to avoid what has become kind of the hotbed issue uh, since the Canon EOS R5 and other such discussions have come. And then going further back with some of the Sony bodies where heat dissipation has been kind of a, an Achilles heel for them. Obviously what you do end up with, however, is uh, you know not the same degree of weather sealing in the body, which you essentially can't if you have open you know, heat sinks built right into the design of the camera itself. So let's talk about the autofocus. They've made some tweaks here and we're going to dive in and take a look at that in some detail. So let's talk about autofocus on the FPL. Now the original FP that came out uh, last year, it had a similar amount of focus points, which is 49 but it was only contrast AF based at the time. So there certainly are limitations to contrast AF. That's kind of where a lot of mirrorless cameras started. And then they transitioned towards where Sigma is working towards now, which is a hybrid system as it's called, where the primary focus is phase detect and it's backed up by contrast, you know, to kind of try to fill the gaps where phase detect might come up short. And so in this case though, 49 selectable points it covers a fairly good portion of the frame. I will note, however, that the selection process is a little bit of a challenge for me. Now, you can tap the screen to raise up kind of a grid pattern that allows you to select a point. But the nature of the grid is that they're kind of rectangle shaped and they're spread out in such a way to where I, I find it sometimes a little bit hard to get that bigger box on a smaller point. And so I have no option of zooming in tighter than that. I can only zoom out larger. And so much like on a Fuji body, you can use the wheel to control how many points are active or how few down to one. But even at the smallest selection point, it's a little bit large for, for my taste. And so I, I feel like I lose a little bit of precision uh, in that regard. Now you can uh, touch to focus to move things around. One thing I will note though is that if you're kind of starting from scratch, as you touch, the first thing you do is you kind of bring up that grid and then you can kind of move it around within the framework of the grid. You could also use the, you know, the kind of the D-pad slash wheel to move that focus point around. And I think that in, uh, in many cases, you're probably going to want to do that. I prefer, my preferred shooting method on either Canon or Sony is basically to have all points active to allow the camera to kind of AI select the appropriate focus point. And if it doesn't get it right, which it does, you know, 90 plus percent of the time, I could then override and put focus where I want it. I can't really use the FPL consistently, at least with the current firmware. And again, I'll point out, I have a pre-production model here. You know, things could probably will get some better. However, some of the observations I've got still on the FPL were there on reviewers of the FP also. But anyway, I didn't find that I could trust the, you know, just having all points active, let it AI select the natural point. I just didn't find that it consistently settled on a point. So for example, I wanted to shoot with this uh, lantern that was just, we were just out walking and so someone had on their, uh, kind of around their mailbox, they had this lantern. It was kind of a cool scene. So I went to shoot it, but it just never really settled on much of anything. Nothing is really in focus. And I had to then get a little bit more precise, select a point, put it where I wanted, and then I got an accurately focused result, as you can see here. Now, on the, on the positive note, the sensitivity here is quite good. It's sensitive down to minus five EV, which is a very strong figure, better than some competing cameras and then up to a plus 18 EV. It does uh, enable you to have IAF where you can select, you know, either face select or to go more specifically on the eye. I found when uh, shooting, using IAF that it, it doesn't work with pets at this point. It's, it's people only. But what I also found is that if I had more than one person in the frame, IAF was not fantastic. It just, again, it was a problem with settling. It couldn't decide where it wanted to focus. And so the more fine dot uh, to track the eye, which is finer than what you can select on your own, it would just keep jumping around from person to person. And it would be fairly random by the time that I actually, you know, click the shutter. 
whose face, whose eye would be in focus. And sometimes it would be kind of in between choosing. And so I just didn't find that anyone was amazingly well focused, even though I was shooting at a, you know, an F5.6 aperture where depth of field should have been, you know, deep enough that the whole group was uh, is in focus. It just, it, it wasn't precise. And I found that I ended up preferring to just, again, go in and manually select a point and just kind of set focus where I wanted it to. I also found that in trying to track eyes for video purpose that I got really erratic results. Let's take a look at kind of a standard test for that. So we are testing focus on the FPL and Sigma 65 millimeter F2. We'll see how it does as I approach the camera and if it continues to keep my face eye in focus, looking away, looking back, So as you can see, focus was only rarely where it needed to be during that sequence. And under identical sequences using the Sony A7R Mark III, which has the, the least of the focus systems of my Sony cameras, I, um, I use that as a test. And as you can see, I got much better results even with the A7R Mark III. So, I mean, th that's an area where I wasn't particularly pleased. I also was not pleased because of the settling issue when I was doing a static type shot. Now, on paper, I, I like the concept here. Um, it can be used as a webcam. It can be used to film long format. I do a lot of like long format teaching to where I'm more than 30 minutes and it's a pain to have to reset in the middle, you know, and try to time for that. I actually, a lot of times, set a, a timer on my, you know, my smartwatch here and so I know to kind of try to have a cutoff point in my flow of conversation before I need to start a, a new track. It's a pain though. So I love the fact that you can do long format recording here but unfortunately I just don't feel like at this stage with the firmware as it is that I could trust it for those static kind of settings because as you can see it just wouldn't settle down and stay focused where it needed to be. You know, by contrast at the moment, that was with the FPL and the Sigma 24 to 70 millimeter f2.8 DN. Right now I'm filming on the Sony A9 and the uh, Tamron 2875 uh, f2.8. And I think you're probably going to have found that focus was very steady during this segment. I use this combination all the time and I can rely on it. And so I would need to see, you know, more confidence in just settling and keeping focus where it needed to be before I would trust the FPL in that kind of situation. It also did not do a give me a great performance for my focus pulls test. And so we'll take a quick look at the test first and then I'll give you some observations. Now, what you can't see is that very often there was a pretty significant lag between when I touched the screen, again, you can touch to focus, I touched, there would be a lag, and then it would start. But as you could see, a lot of times it was just never confident enough to settle on where it needed to be. And um, so it was just, it was not great. Now, by comparison, I did the, I was using the Sigma 65 millimeter F2 and the L mount on this. I actually reviewed this lens back in December of 2020 on, um, on the Sony E mount. And so here is that same test run on an A9 and then the 65 millimeter F2. So as you can see, a much different result in terms of confidence. So they've still got a ways to go with developing focus that is going to be you know, truly compatible, competitive with 
um, I think, a lot of the you know, existing competitors on the market. Kind of my best case scenario in use was actually using it on a gimbal to where uh, typically you, know, you don't need a lot of focusing, you just need focus to kind of shift as you moved either towards a subject or maybe move over and you know, shift from a foreground to a distant subject. And as you can see in some of these clips, it did a decent job for that used on a gimbal. But my conclusion is, is that autofocus still needs further development at this point and isn't quite where I would want it to be as a photographer. So as you can see, definitely some areas there where I'm less than thrilled with the current state of affairs, at least in this pre-production model at this point. I will point out that it does have a fairly decent burst rate, up to 10 frames per second, but very, very shallow buffers here. And so you can only get up to 12 frames of raw recording, up to 14 JPEG. And so this is not going to be a great action camera because of that fundamental limitation there. And so, you know, obviously that's something that I'm not crazy about as well. Another thing that has, is reminded me of how much I miss it. I've become spoiled in that it seems like most new cameras utilize some kind of in-body image stabilization. The FPL does not. And for a camera that's really designed in many ways around video functionality, I found that to be a really severe loss. And I have forgotten just how shaky handheld video without in-body image stabilization is. Here's a couple of clips that I, I did while I was out and, and wasn't even hardly thinking about the fact that it didn't have in-body image stabilization. And, and I was just reminded of how poor results I could get handheld. And so definitely a negative for me in not having uh, in-body image stabilization. I don't miss it so much on the photography side. Um, you know, I do miss it, but not to the same degree. But for video, unless you have some other source of stability, you really aren't going to be able to do just kind of run and gun handheld video, which really seems like a shame because run and gun seems like what this camera was designed for. I mean, if you're emphasizing a pocketable camera, it's not all that pocketable if you have to put it on a gimbal to get smooth results or put it on a tripod to get uh, smooth results. And so to me, that's, that's certainly an area in a future iteration that Sigma has to do. They have to utilize, if they really want to market a run and gun kind of camera, they need to include in-body image stabilization. A few other things related to focus that I do want to highlight, and that is that the even with the you know hot shoe accessory, the, because of the fact that this is built ar around an electronic shutter and an electronic shutter alone, the sync speed is basically, you know, almost unusable. It's one fifteenth of a second, and I can't hardly imagine a suitable application for that. Uh, and so it's it's just for any kind of portrait type work, it is that's that's it's just an unusable figure. So if you're a portrait photographer, I don't really see this being a great camera for you, if unless your portrait style is completely available or natural light. Now let's talk about image quality. One of the things that I really like here is that right out of the box, this camera actually uses the D lossless DNG format, which is the Adobe standard. And so this is a camera that makes it very easy to just pull it and plug it into lots of pieces of editing software, which because of the, you know, how big Adobe is in the industry, almost every other piece of editing software is compatible with DNG files. And Adobe has assured us that they will support that into perpetuity. And so obviously, Obviously that gives us a good standard to work around, so I like that. I also really like the fact that rather than going from one to like a full no crop to an extreme, you know, 1.5 or in the case of Canon, 1.6 crop, Sigma actually gives you a lot of different crop modes here. So you can go from the full resolution drop down to 6.2 then down to um, 4 and 4.8, and then on down into like the resolutions like, you know, 4K and even full HD. So they allow you to have these crop modes both in still and in in video. And that obviously is, is really useful because it means that in some situations you might want some additional reach, additional framing options, uh, without having to resort to cropping in post, but you don't have to go all the way to an extreme. You have some different steps there along the way. So one of the things that I criticize the most about the A7R Mark IV, for example, and the R3 before it, is that you've got lots of resolution, but you have no way to use slightly less and still shoot raw. And, and so the Sigma does solve that. So kudos to them on solving what I think should be an 
a simple problem that should be addressed in all cameras, but it isn't. And so kudos to them for doing that. So we've got a very high resolution sensor. Let's jump in and let's take a look in detail as to how it performs. Let's start by taking a look quickly at the resolution. Obviously 61 megapixels is a lot of resolution and so that definitely opens up some possibilities, particularly in such a compact little body. Now, in this case, I've used the uh, Sigma 24 to 70 millimeter f2.8 DN art, and so a very good lens. And as you can see, we have very nice resolution throughout this real world image. And so you see, obviously, a lot of potential there for, uh, for cropping, deep cropping, and for printing, you know, great flexibility. So certainly capable of producing highly detailed images. Now, I never had the Sony a7R Mark IV and the Sigma 65mm at the same time, and so I don't have a chance to give you a direct 61 to 61 or 62 megapixel comparison, but I did uh, test it on the a7R Mark III, and so that's going to be here on the right. So I wanted to see a comparison. I downsampled the FP FPL results to, uh, just to give us just a, a more direct comparison to the resolution of the a7R Mark III. Now, if we just look at, uh, you know, 100%, there's lots of detail everywhere. So, you know, no problem there. So we're going to jump in a little bit further to 200%. So at 200%, one thing that does stand out is that the, um, the A7R Mark III is far more likely to go towards a moire pattern, as you can see uh, manifest here. Contrast seems a little bit higher uh, between the two, just the way that they're presenting. Amount of detail is similar. I wouldn't say that I see any kind of you know market advantage for the FPL in this situation. In this zone here, you know, again, you can definitely see the moire pattern, so definitely a little bump to sigma of controlling moire better. But, um, you know, not necessarily any kind of significant resolution boost that I can see between the two. Here in the corners, I would say maybe I see a little bit more detail uh, compared to the, you know, the R3 results. But, you know, it's, it's nothing that's uh, significant in that sense, even down sample to equal resolution. But there's no question, I mean, the Sony is a very well-established sensor. There's no question that we're getting very, very excellent results out of the Sigma sensor. So let's take a look at our ISO performance. And so first of all, our base ISO, we'll take a quick peek here. Some areas where we're gonna see, you know, the potential of noise coming in is in this kind of shadowed area here, uh, inside the uh, SLRs area. Take a look at, keep a look at the contrast here. We're gonna see how that holds up as we go down. Down in this area, we'll be able to see as noise starts to creep in. And then obviously we're going to be monitoring overall color levels to see if color fidelity holds up and contrast holds up as we boost ISO. Now we're gonna jump right up to uh, 1600 because my experience is, is that modern cameras have no problem at all before this. And as you can see, there's almost non-apparent amount of new noise introduced inside the uh, mirror area here. It all looks the same. Contrast levels look roughly the same. And if we look down in this zone, there is a very, very fine amount of uh, pattern noise there, but it is just minimal. So if we go on up to 3200, you can see that that noise is becoming a little bit more obvious for sure as you begin to go out. And so as the noise increases, typically the black levels will start to lift a bit. At this stage, however, though, it's really minimal. Contrast still looks good. I mean, we still have base ISO here on the left. I will say that in this zone, it seems like the there's the tiniest bit of color shift by comparison, but it is, it is minimal. And we can see pop out looking that our colors, if not quite is rich are still fairly similar. So looking at things uh, at 6400, we can see looking at it globally, everything is looking still pretty similar. Uh, we'll zoom into our inspection zones here. So we can see in this zone, I mean, very, very fine a noise, no problem there. And uh, looking here at the SLR, you know, contrast is still looking pretty similar to what it's been. A little bit of extra noise starting coming in here, but so fine that I don't really see an issue there. If we look over into this area here, you can see that the noise is becoming rougher, obviously, and, uh, and it's going to keep that up. Not a whole lot of like hot pixels out here, and so overall, again, it still looks good. At 12,800, contrast is down ever so slightly, nothing significant though. Uh, we look in here, you can start to see that that noise is becoming a little more obvious, but it's still so fine that I don't find it to be really objectionable. You can see it in different places, so it's just not as smooth compared to the base ISO. 
But as you can see, detail is still holding up. Contrast still looks pretty good. The noise patterning is, is getting rougher, but again, the black areas still look pretty good. You're starting to get a little scattering of brighter pixels, but not too bad, really. So 25,600 is the last spot in the native ISO range. And so what we're going to find here is that you're definitely starting to see a bit of image deterioration. Just the noise pattern is getting a little bit rougher. That in itself is not too big a deal. You know, contrast level, as you can tell, is not as deep. I'm more concerned at areas where we're just getting inconsistency in terms of this all should remain black and you can see how that we're starting to lose that and thus lose contrast as a result. Down here things are pretty rough but I particularly notice up in this area that should be all uniformly dark that there's just a lot more scattered you know kind of what I call a brighter or hotter pixel that start to rob the image of contrast. Now if we do a quick comparison to the A7R Mark III with a 65 millimeter lens on there uh, taking a look in here, we can see that noise levels are quite similar in a lot of ways. Where the Sony wins, though, is, is that it just delivers a more even, evenness in terms of the black uh, levels that are more uniform. You don't see this starting to come in. And even on the red, you can see how that the color fidelity remains a little bit better because it's just more consistently colored. Um, and down here into this you know, book, the purple remains a little bit better. And then most particularly, if we look off into this area, you just see a lot more of that uneven pixel illumination that is out there and things looking a little bit rougher in this area as well. So again, ISO, high ISO performance is quite good up till 25,600 where it's usable in some situations, but not as good as what Sony is. So now we're going to take a look at the dynamic range and starting with recovery of shadows. And so this is our base exposure here on the right. I've actually jumped right to the four stops of uh, shadow recovery. That tends to be a strength for cameras uh, these days. And so first of all, looking at things globally, we can see that there is a little bit of a shift in the white balance that has come as a part of uh, going to a lower exposure. And uh, we can see, however, that unlike before, where at high ISO you saw a real unevenness in the recovered kind of shadow area, in this case, it looks still nice and black and consistent. And if we look at the red tones, you know, you just see much less damage uh, to all of that. Color Fidelity looks good, very little noise in here. And even in this area where we most see pattern noise, there's only a minimal amount. So doing a good job of recovering shadows. And again, just to give you some perspective on how deeply crushed shadows were, you can see the original exposure before I added four stops in post. And so, for example, in an area like the uh, grip of the camera, there was almost nothing visible there. All of that has been recovered. Inside here, nothing visible. All of that is recovered. So the only thing that I, I think I would cite as a negative is there is a tiny bit of a color shift um, when recovering shadows. So how about recovering highlights? Here the camera doesn't fare as well. And so we can see even at a two stop of recovery, we're starting to lose the yellow where the red has shifted a little bit. And even if we look at the timer face here, you can see that there has been some shifting to where it's not even anymore. Some of it that is, uh, you know, it's, it's, kind of the original color here around the edges, but you can see places where that's being lost. And thus this kind of looks unnatural compared to the base exposure. And at three stops, things are looking really uh, fairly poor here. You can see that we've completely lost the yellow. There's a shift in the reds here uh, quite badly. And then you can also just see from the overall kind of dullness of the recovered image that you're not recovering highlights successfully here. You're not restoring proper brightness at three stops. And so definitely not quite at Sony level. We'll give you that quick comparison here. So taking a look at the comparison with the Sony, we can see that, yes, the Sony has started to lose those colors as well. The di primary difference here is that the Sony's image is still more kind of usable. It has a more you know proper tonality and brightness, whereas we have a more uneven performance from the Sigma here. Looking here at the timer face, both of them have lost some information. As you can see, the Sigma has lost more and it's lost contrast in the process. Looking at the spine of this book, it is essentially close to normal on the, um, the Sony side, but on the Sigma side, you can see some places where detail and contrast are being lost, and it just has a little bit more of an artificial, unnatural look. 
At the same time, I do feel overall that, you know, the dynamic range is certainly usable here. So here's a real world shot where, um, just because of where my new kitten was laying, that his face was completely in shadow, all the lighting was coming in the wrong direction. But I was able to pull up those shadows really cleanly, as you can see, and allow his, you know, pretty features and the detail of his fur to, you know, to come to light there. And so certainly some value in the recovery of shadows and overall um, dynamic range here. So in conclusion, we've got a, you know, a good sensor performance. I don't think that it's at the tier yet of, you know, what Sony's putting out, for example, but that's a lot of resolution and a, a definitely a usable amount of both ISO and um, dynamic range performance. And so this is a good sensor and a really compact body. So that's a good starting point. However, I think that some of these other aspects of designs limit that performance. You know, not having in-body in image stabilization is a limiting principle at this point. Not having a viewfinder or even a hot shoe and being able to do, uh, you know, more normal sync speeds, that's going to be a liability. And so I, I, I see there being basically two audiences that make sense, where this camera makes sense for them. One audience is if you are a person that really wants to travel light, but you want really high performance, high resolution. Right now, this is the only way you can get this high of resolution in this small of a body. The problem is, you know, or the challenge is, is that you're going to have to select compact lenses if going compact is your priority. And so, you know, Sigma's own new lenses like the new 28 to 70 uh, millimeter f2.8, good option. Obviously their i series, particularly this being the largest of them, this is the 65 millimeter f2, but even more so if you're talking the 35 millimeter f2, the um, the 24 millimeter f3.5, 45 millimeter f2.8, all of those are nice compact yet high performing lenses, you know, that might be a nice pairing with this camera and, you know, so on and so forth. But, you know, for example, Sigma sent me the 24 to 70 millimeter f2.8 DN in an L mount to use for the test. And while I appreciated the versatility of that lens, it's so big that you, you basically lose all of the compact functionality of the camera itself. And so, you know, you're going to have to be wise in the lens choices that you make if you want to keep this as kind of a pocketable or very, you know, small compact camera to bring along. The other application that I, I could see people doing is if they are video focused, for one thing, we've got a lot of different color modes that are built in, more than are typical, and so some, including some new ones that they have, have kind of debuted here on the FPL, um, as you can see here. But again, if you're gonna shoot video, if your video style is shooting off of a gimbal or if it's shooting off of a tripod, this is a camera that makes some sense. I mean, you can set it up, you know, even with the, you can even set up if you're using a loop type uh, viewfinder attachment, you can make sure that the crop factor, they'll give you a lot of options in the menu so you can, if you're using other cameras, that you can align to make sure you're seeing the same kind of, of crop uh, through that. And, and obviously they've, they've got some nice video video centric type modes here but I, I do think again that they need to improve autofocus in many ways I think right now that this is a great video camera for manual focus users less grade a video camera for those that want autofocus as a part of their video capture but if you're looking at kind of building you accessorize anyway you're not looking for the viewfinder on there or even an LCD screen, you're using a monitor, you're using a gimbal, you've got this array. This is a, a pretty sweet little camera to put into a, you know, a little bit of a cage and accessorize all around it. And obviously the very square, you know, kind of component um, design of it makes it an easy fit in a cage type application. So I think that there are, there is an audience for this camera. It's just not a mainstream one. And, and I hope that this review has helped you to see the areas where it may or may not fit your own unique needs. It remains a camera that for me, I don't love it for my own applications, but I also am smart enough to recognize I'm not really the intended audience. Where they are marketing for and designing for are not areas that I'm desperately looking for or needing. I don't, you know, I don't go for like super small. I prefer a good robust grip in the hand, and I don't even care if a mirrorless camera is DSLR sized. That's, but there's a lot of people that do care. And so I think that they're obviously 
There's a market for them, and I wish Sigma every success in launching this new camera. I'm Dustin Abbott, and if you look in the description down below, you can find linkage to my text review and also to an image gallery if you want to check out photos there. There's also some buying links, though, again, with anything that is just coming to market, it may take a little while before some of them populate and the various retailers get their listing in place, so just watch for that. Beyond that, there is linkage there to check out my merch for my channel. There's also linkage there to follow me on social media, to become a patron, sign up for my newsletter, and of course, if you haven't already, please click that subscribe button right here on YouTube. Be sure to click that bell and so you're notified when new content drops. Thanks for watching. Have a great day and let the light in.